Last Sunday, we started a five-week series in the book of Galatians, and we started with chapter one, and Paul opens his letter to these churches in this, in this region of the Roman Empire uh, with, with anger and astonishment. He can't believe that the churches there have turned to what he calls another gospel, and this other gospel that the Galatians have turned to requires Gentiles to adopt the Jewish law and customs, including circumcision, in order to become part of the family of God. This was an appealing message for the Jewish Christians, not so much for the Gentile Christians, and for Paul it was contrary to the gospel itself. For Paul, religion had become an enemy of grace. And when that happens, we need a little less religion, a little bit more Grace, And that is what Paul is trying to drive home for the Galatians. So now we turn to chapter 2 and we start at the 11th verse. But when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood self-condemned. For until certain people came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But after they came, he drew back and kept himself separate for fear of the circumcision faction. And the other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not acting consistently with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet We know that a person is justified not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by doing the works of the law, because no one will be justified by the works of the law. But if in our effort to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not, but if I build up again the very things that I once tore down, then I demonstrate that I am a transgressor. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if justification comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, by the power of your spirit, as we hear your word this morning, may we also hear your voice. May we know your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we started in the middle of chapter 2, but the beginning of chapter 2 is Paul telling the Galatians about a trip he made to Jerusalem. He came to Jerusalem and, and there he met with the, um, the big leaders of the Christian church. And Paul wants to establish his own authority for the churches in Galatia. He wants to establish his independence from all the other apostles. He wants to establish his right to challenge what he is calling an other gospel. Paul, it says in chapter 2, and Peter had an arrangement that Paul was to, to take the gospel to the uncircumcised, that Peter was to take the gospel to the circumcised. And then we come halfway through our chapter and we see Paul describing what could be called a clash of the biblical titans, an apostolic cage match between Paul and Peter. Two of the biggest figures in the Christian church at odds with each other. Here's what happened. Naturally, Jerusalem was the center of the Christian church as it began. And so that's where its leadership was centered. But Paul was an outsider to the Jerusalem church. Paul, as we know, had been Saul, a persecutor of the church. He was on the road on the way to Damascus when he was converted, not by Jesus in flesh and blood, but by the risen Christ who met him on the road. 
And so Paul was not one of the original 12, not one of those who knew Jesus personally, who traveled around with Jesus. Paul came a little bit later. Paul was sort of on the fringes of these apostles. He was doing a different sort of work than the others. The others believed that the gospel was first and foremost, as Jesus said it was, for the Jews, for Israel. But Paul felt compelled to take the gospel out beyond the borders of Jerusalem, beyond Israel to the Gentiles. And so when Paul tells of his visit to Jerusalem, he works hard to maintain that status as an outsider because he believes that the Jerusalem church is sort of missing the point. And he wants to make sure that he doesn't get grouped in with them. And yet at the same time, he doesn't want to destroy their authority. He doesn't want to undermine the unity of this this, uh, very early infant church. And so he finds himself in conflict with these these uh, big apostolic leaders of the Jerusalem church. And Paul talks about when Peter went to Antioch, an early Christian city, and he tells of, of Peter um, participating in the, the practices that had been developed there. And in Antioch, Gentiles had been welcomed into fellowship with the Jewish Christians. They were eating around the same tables. And when Peter went to Antioch, he did exactly the same thing. He joined in the table fellowship of the, of the Christians there, which included both Gentiles and Jewish Christians. For Paul, this is good. For Paul, this is a reflection of the gospel as it should be. But then Paul mentions certain men from James. It sounds a little bit like James is a, a godfather and he sends his henchmen to see what's going on with Peter, and Peter gets intimidated. And so Peter separates himself from this table fellowship of mixed Gentiles and Jewish Christians. Later on, in another letter, Paul will speak of the letter. He'll say that the letter kills, but the Spirit brings life. The letter of the law brings death, but the Spirit brings life. And this is a good example for Paul of of how that is living itself out in the community because not only does Peter separate himself out from the table fellowship of, of Christians in Antioch, but then others follow suit. Even Barnabas, this young church leader that Paul is bringing up, is separating himself out from the Gentiles. Peter's fear of the circumcision faction. Now, in the RSV, that gets translated as the circumcision party, which does not sound like a party I would want to be at. (laughs) Peter is afraid of the circumcision party, the faction, this group of people advocating for the circumcision of Gentiles who want to become Christians. And others follow his example. I'm trying to think of a contemporary example of what this might look like. Bob Parrott, who's probably back in our sound uh, room there is an Ohio State fan, bless his heart. Um, It would be like Bob, who lives among us in southeastern Michigan, making friends with someone like Kim Ewald, who is, as we know, a diehard Michigan fan. And Kim invites Bob to a game, and they're good friends, so Bob goes to this Michigan game. Well, then certain uh, buddies of Bob's from Columbus come up to visit, And they learn that Bob has been going to Michigan games and Bob is afraid. And so Bob decides he can't associate with Kim anymore. (laughs) He can't go to Michigan games anymore, no matter how fun they might be, lest word get back to his friends in Columbus that he'd turned traitor. This is a little bit like, in a more lighthearted way, a little bit like what's going on for Peter. Peter sees the, the Christian church developing and he jumps right in and it's good. But he's concerned about division. He's concerned about how this will look back in Jerusalem, back in the capital, back in the heart of the Christian church. And so he backs away. And Paul (coughs) sees in Peter's backing away a a violation of the gospel, a failure to live out the gospel. And he confronts Peter. He says, how can you live like this is all fine, joining with the Gentiles in a meal, and then suddenly turn around and expect the Gentiles to adopt the law. Paul calls him a hypocrite. And this for Paul becomes a springboard into discussing the justification, uh, justification by faith and not by works. And here he shifts into high theological gear, which means he becomes very difficult 
to follow. He's like a preacher who gets really worked up and suddenly starts bringing in all the big words he learned in seminary but doesn't really understand what they mean. If I ever do that, let me know. <laughs> but this is his central message in this letter and in others. The justification, justification by faith and not by works. For Paul, this little conflict in Antioch, which is not part of Galatia, this little conflict serves for him as a perfect opening to address justification by faith and not by works. But we need to know what justification means. Often this word is used interchangeably with salvation. To be justified is to be saved, but this is not how Paul intends the word to be understood. This is not how Paul is using the word. And so we have to remember the context of the early church here and the context of this conflict. This conflict is about who is included in the family of God, who is a part of the church, and what it takes to be included. And so being included uh, for the Jewish Christians requires certain steps. There are certain prerequisites involved if you want to join this family. And so the word justification <clears throat> comes from the judicial language of the ancient world. It's think of a courtroom and a judge issuing a verdict. And to be justified is to be given the verdict of not guilty. To be declared to be in the right or righteous, to use a very biblical word, word. And so the question becomes, on what basis is that verdict pronounced? By what are we justified? What is that qualifier? What is that criterion that justifies us, that gives us that not guilty verdict in the eyes of the judge? There's a, a well-known story of Margaret Thatcher when she was Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. She was visiting a nursing home and walking from room to room and, and visiting with the patients there and talking with them. And at one point she was shaking a woman's hand and she realized that this woman did not recognize her, did not realize that she was shaking the hand of her Prime Minister. And so Margaret Thatcher says to this woman, do you know who I am? And the woman says, no, but if I were you, I would ask the nurse. She usually knows. <laughs> Paul is suggesting that what the church needs, that what we need is a little bit of amnesia, that what we need is to forget a little bit who we are. Paul believes that our problem maybe is that we know ourselves too well, or maybe that we think of ourselves too highly, that we cling to ourselves too tightly, which is why we want to justify ourselves. We want our efforts to count for something. We don't want our hard work and our sacrifice to go unnoticed or unrewarded, and we don't want those who haven't paid their dues to be elevated to the same status as us. And so Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In Christ, Paul believes he has been eclipsed. Paul believes that he has disappeared, that he is even dead, crucified. And all that's left is Christ. And his life in the flesh is not lived by faith in circumcision. It's not lived by faith in dietary restrictions. It's not lived by faith in extraordinary self-discipline. It's lived by faith in the Son of God. But there's a snag here for us. This is something, this snag, that didn't really seem to trouble Paul. It didn't really seem to trouble the early church, but it did trouble the reformers. And it does still trouble us today. And it comes down to one little word, and that word is faith. The Greek word that gets translated as faith is pistis, and it means faith, but it also means trust. And it also means faithfulness. And a lot hangs on this little word. Paul writes, we have come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by doing the works of the law because no one will be justified by the works of the law. For us, faith typically means belief. It typically is 
uh, I, uh, identical to this notion of belief, intellectual assent to propositional truth. Our faith is what we believe or what we believe in. And so faith in Jesus Christ means to us our belief in certain things about Jesus. He's the Son of God. He, he was sent to die for us. Our sins are forgiven in Him. These are the things that we believe about Jesus. This is the content of our faith in Jesus. But here's the snag that I'm talking about. The problem here is that we have turned faith into a work. Justification by faith then turns out to be a clever trick. We've only changed which work is necessary for salvation or rather for justification. It's no longer a physical work now. It's an intellectual one or a spiritual one, but it still boils down to us and to what we do, to which Paul says, if I build up again the very things that I once tore down, then I demonstrate that I am a transgressor. So what does Paul mean by faith in Christ? Many New Testament scholars believe that that phrase is better translated as the faithfulness of Christ. Not faith in Christ, but the faithfulness of Christ. And it's a perfectly accurate translation of that word faith. And it clearly has a very different meaning. We've come to, he writes, we have come to trust in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by the faithfulness of Christ and not by doing the works of the law. This removes us from the equation. We've been taken out. Instead of being justified by our own faith in Jesus Christ, we are justified by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. We disappear completely. Anything that we try to put in the place of Jesus' own faithfulness becomes a work of the law, and Christ died for nothing. This not guilty verdict that is issued is not because we have believed the right things about Jesus, but only because Jesus is faithful. In Christ, we have been eclipsed. We have disappeared. We have died. We have been crucified. And we no longer live, but Christ lives in us. And the life that we now live in the flesh, the life we live in the body, is not lived by trust in the law or trust in correct doctrine or by trust in ourselves. It is lived by the faithfulness of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. Let us pray. God, may we put our trust in you and in your son, in the faithfulness that he has shown, in the faithfulness that he invites us to, and not in ourselves. In his name we pray.